What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Draymond Green Show YouTube channel. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like the post that you love, but you can get everything the Draymond Green Show right on our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe. Check that out. Thank you. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to this Draymond Green Show. We got another legend, uh, uh, basketball royalty here today. Another one of the greats, 10th pick in 98 NBA draft, 2008 NBA champion and finals MVP, 10-time All-Star, one-time All-NBA second team, three-time All-NBA third team, a member of the NBA 75th anniversary team. His number 34 is retired by... We don't really want to talk about this team because they just beat us really bad, but they're retired by none other than the Boston Celtics. Um, a man with the nickname, the truth, Paul Pierce. Welcome to the Draymond Green Show. What's, what's up? What's up, Dre? Hey, hold on. Before we get started, I got to address your viral shit talking first off, because you just said Joe's side of it, and I ain't had a chance to say my side of it yet. And so I'm going to start off with that, first of all. The shit where you was yes, like, you sir. don't want no farewell tour. You thought you was Kobe. <laughs> All right, so let me go to my side of the story. Get in on the action with the DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers who deposit $5 or more can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 back in bonus bets. How cool of a deal is that? All you have to do is download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. It takes 90 seconds and use the code Colin. C-O-L-I-N. This is the best deal you're going to find. New customers, it's a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses. How cool is that? Only at DraftKings Sportsbook, code is Colin. The crown is yours. Yes, sir. Now, the Golden State Warriors were starting the beginning of the height of their superpowers, and Draymond had the height of his superpowers as one of the more intimidating players, and top defensive guy in the league, and I, I'm on the Clippers. You know, I feel like I'm on a team that got a chance to maybe challenge y'all. So I just feel like it just looked like Clippers was kind of intimidated by you, uh, Steph, and all of that. And so I wanted to bring a little edge to the table. And I wasn't really playing much then, so it was hard. So we go into the game, and I'm just seeing how you guard Blake. And I'm like, damn, he'd be a hella physical, and he pushing on him. I'm like, you know, what the fuck going on, man? Hold on, Blake. Bust his ass, man. Hell no. You can't let him do that because everybody know you the head of the snake. And if you go at the head of the snake, you got a shot. And I didn't want y'all to think we was intimidated. So I'm yelling, I'm whooping at you. We at the free throw line, I think. I forget who at the free throw line. And I'm whooping at you like, no, fuck that, man. Fuck him. Go at him, Blake. You better than him. Whatever. And so I'm like, all right. I'm shooting. I want everybody to know this is what we own this year. You know, mm -hmm. damn, come on. This is the class of the league right now. And you said what you said, right? And everybody, the camera on me. So when I, and to be honest, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> People don't know this, but the microphone underneath the basket pick up everything. And so when you're in the arena, it's hard to hear. I'm on, the, I'm on the sideline, I'm on the bench, and it's hard to hear. So it make it look like you shot something to me. But honestly, I didn't even hear what you said until after the game. I'm looking at my Twitter like, oh, damn. You know, he went back at me because I, I couldn't really see you. I'm on the bench. <laughs> You're on the other side. But I do love your banner. And I will tell you this. <clears throat> I love the fact that you stay true to who you are because even before you won, you was like that. Because I remember we came in there in Boston when you was talking shit to KG. And I'm like, so who is this dude right here? Like, like <laughs> really looking at him. Y'all ain't won yet. But you yep. was already, you You had that. You remember that? We cared to go to state. Absolutely. You was talking shit to KG. I'm like, who is this little nigga right here? Who is? He was, I was like, damn. And so it all makes sense now. Like, you always been like that. You know, some people, they start winning or they get some money and they turn into something mm -hmm. else. You know what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. But you came in true to yourself and I appreciate that, man. And, you know, I love what you've been doing to the game. And I just want everybody to know between me and you, it ain't never been no beef. Good banner. I respect your game and what you brought to the game, man. No, I appreciate that. I definitely remember that because I remember coming in. You know how KG, KG, <laughs> KG will stand next to you. I've I've actually told you a story before. KG will stand next to you 
And he will call you every B in the book. Yeah, yeah. He will call you every th- 304 in the book. He he's yeah. gonna call you soft, all of that. And he's just gonna stand at the free throw line next to you and say all of these things about you. <laughs> and I'm standing there and I'm like, Yo, this nigga, first of all, I'm like, this nigga's crazy. Like, <laughs> I'm just standing there listening to him. I'm like, who is he oh, talking to, man? Like, because he, he gonna he come back down, down the court and talking yes. to you, though, and you know he's talking to. You. And I'm like, all right, we go back down the court. <laughs> Another foul happened. We at the free throw line. He's like, yeah, this little nigga can't fuck with me. Little soft ass. Nigga. And I'm just sitting there like, hey, yo, I ain't gonna be no more. I ain't gonna be too many more of your soft. Hey, you ain't gonna keep right. talking to me right. like that. <laughs> and he like. Yeah, whatever, little nigga. I ain't getting into that with you today. I'm like, no, you gonna get into it with me today. You keep talking to me like that. I remember that. that. But that, like, that's just, you know, it's it's funny because I've just always been taught by 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 my mom, by my neighborhood, like the foot that you start off on, yeah, that's where it's going. You know, so like Coach Izzo, when 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 I first got to campus, and I won't say I won't say that what he called me publicly, but when I first got to campus, my first text was Coach Izzo. He called me a very specific name, and I went crazy. And I'm like, right. and now, mind you, I'm a fat, pudgy freshman. Like, when I say fat, mm-hmm. pudgy, I, I was real fat and pudgy. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm not, like, the highest recruit. Like, we got two recruits uh, of my three rec- uh, three-person class. I'm the lowest recruit. Mm-hmm. And... And he caught, and I lost it, and and I start like cussing him out, like don't don't mm-hmm. ever call me that, and he never called me that again. But it was, but he only never called me that again because I stopped it then. You, stood you know what on I'm it. saying? Right, absolutely. And so that's just kind of how I always been. So when that happened with KG, you know, for me, you growing up, you know, and and especially for me, I'm growing up and watching KG in particular with his emotion, you know what I'm saying? And Mm -hmm. how he wears emotions on his sleeve and he loud and he communicate. So I felt like I could relate to that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like I play with my emotions on my sleeve. Like I'm going to talk to the next guy. I'm going to scream on you when I do something to you, you know? And like watching KG do that, I'm like, oh man, that's dope. But then you come into the league and now it's like, I can't really be that fan. You know what I'm saying? Like I got to come in here and stand on business. Or they're going to treat you like that, fan. And so when I came in and I, and I noticed him doing it, I'm like, hold on, man. Like, this is KG, yeah. but you can't just sit and talk to me like that, bro. Right. You know? But but even getting into the moment that you just got into, uh, I had no idea the, thing, the, the microphone picked that up either. Like, I got mm-hmm. to my phone, and I was so upset. I was so upset because... You know, at that time, and you had just came into the rivalry, right? Like you, yeah, we, yeah. You know, it's us, the Clippers. Who's the next young team out? You know what I'm saying? And we had just won, but you know, it's still kind of right there. Like right. Doc had just said that you're like, oh, they only won because such and such was hurt, and this person was hurt, and so it's still kind of right, fresh in those moments. And I'm like, right. you know, at that time, Blake was Blake. LaMarcus Aldridge, mm-hmm. like, there was the dogs at the, Zebo. there was the dogs at the fourth spot. You know what I'm right. saying? Zebo, my big bro, Spartan dog. And so for me, when I see these dudes, I just want to kill them. Like y'all saying, right. these is the dudes at the four. I want to kill these dudes. Right. And so you had just came in, me and Blake had already had our thing for a few years leading up to this. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you like, cook him, Blake, he too little. And that trigger for me, I hate when people say he too little because... The reality is I probably really am too little. And so it's kind of one of those pet peeves of like, like, don't fucking tell me I'm too little. And so you're yeah. yelling, he too little, he too little, man. Cook him, Blake. And because you're yelling that, I jump on a Blake Griffin pump fake. And I'm like, yeah. what are you doing, bro? Like, why are <laughs> right you away. jumping on a Blake Griffin pump fake? Like, if Blake Griffin want to shoot a 19-footer, right. by all means... You let Blake Griffin shoot that. I done jumped on the pump fake. I fouled, and you just over there talking. So now I'm even more mad. Like, this dude just made me jump at a Blake Griffin pump fake. Right. He talking. He don't know how much I really don't like Blake in this instance right. because he in my way. Like, I'm I trying to be, I, I want to be an all-star. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I'm like, he saying. in my way. And then I got back to the phone, and I'm like, my phone, I got a million text messages. <laughs> right. And I'm like, why the hell I got all these text messages? I ain't right, did right. nothing crazy. Like, right, right. And I see that. I'm like, oh. 
<laughs> they picked that up. <laughs> right, right. Oh. And I and 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 that 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 was that was a crazy moment. Like I, I still I, I get didn't. that on my Twitter feed every single day. So like I'm like, damn. So I just want to address that. But like I always enjoy, you know, a little banner here and there. If I'd have heard that, I probably would have snapped something back. But uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's all good. It's always love. You know, you're a competitive person just like myself. I wish we could have saw each other when I was in my prime, but you know, <laughs> you do, you doing your thing, dog. And I, and I appreciate that because in a passion, you could have played in any era. Cause I feel like today the passion ain't the same. You know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of guys get too complacent with their brands, the money they make in. And it just feels like I don't see that passion no more. Yeah. You playing hard, but come on playing hard. You see it only a certain few people. You're like, I, I, and I named this before. It's like you, Giannis, Westbrook, Pat Beverly, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe a few more, but just like that, just, you let it out. You don't hold it in. Mm -hmm. And, and I Absolutely. appreciate, you know, still seeing that while it's still in the game. Absolutely. No, I appreciate it. And we, we're going to talk more about that, but uh, before we get into all that, I want to, like, take me back. Uh, you are born in Oakland and then mm -hmm. moved to Inglewood, California. Uh, take, take me back to that journey. It's very interesting to me. Obviously, I, 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 became who I've become in Oakland. Mm -hmm. You know, Oakland is near and dear to my heart. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm very interested yeah. in, in just hearing that story. Yeah, and then I, I, live in, I live in L.A. now, you yeah, know, so yeah. both of those places mean a lot to me. Yeah, so I grew up uh, in Oakland. I got two older brothers who played Division I. Uh, single parent, uh, live with my mom, never, never knew my dad, but, you know, my mom moved around from Chicago, but once my brothers got old enough to college, about nine years old, I moved to L.A., to the east side of L.A., right? We just went from one hood to the next. You know, mom was a, a survivor. She was a nurse just trying to get food on the table, man. Uh, shout out to my mom. I lost my mom last year, but, I, I, man, she taught man, me so many life, life lessons. And, I, you know, she she did everything she could. She left everything that, that man. Uh, and, and so I'm saying that. So we moved to L.A., stayed a year in L.A., then moved to Inglewood. And, and you're like, damn, you know, we moving a lot. We ain't really got no stable place. Uh, what people don't know, when I was in uh, seven or eighth grade, my brother got drafted to play uh, Major League Baseball. Okay. He got drafted 10th pick to play with San Francisco Giants, Steve Hosey. You know, he never really stuck in the big leagues, but he made like a signing bonus. I think he made like 50000 at the time or, or 75000 And that was enough to get us out them apartments. And got us a, a, a cool house in Inglewood to where it was a little safer environment. But I think, you know, moving to Inglewood really molded me, you know, growing up around gangs and drugs and prostitution and, you know, going to an inner city school is not easy when you got to catch the bus. And it kind of shaped me. You know, you know, when your environment shapes you who you are, you can make a decision. Do you want to go one way or the other? And so that's why when people see me on the basketball court and off the court, there's two different people, and I'm sure you can relate to this. This is like we got we carry so many different personalities. Like, this is who I am right here, you know, and, and because of my upbringing. So people think I was unapproachable or I always was mad and, and all of that. But in reality, I love my family, I love people, I'm nice, I'm social, and all of that. But it, it's definitely a journey, you know, to get to where you want to go. And you can see it in certain players. They, they come from something that was difficult and you can see it in their play. And I, and I see that in you, you know, Allen Iverson, you, you see it in KG. You see it when these guys, you know, play with that type of emotion. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, because I always say, like, I, I am the way I am. I play the way I play because that's how I grew up playing in Saginaw. That's how I had to be. Like, mm -hmm. if you were going to get on the court, you had to be that way. If you weren't that way, you was getting ran off the court. Quick. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And so, Same way. Same yeah, way, man. Well, Growing up in the parks, <laughs> you better stand on your foul or, or you're going to get beat up or ran out the park. And don't come back. And don't mm -hmm. come back. <laughs> That's so you always got to stand on that. But talk to me, talk to me about like moving around LA because that's a little dangerous. You know, like yeah, LA yeah. is very like this side, this, this, it can get to streets. Like that street is this gang. This yeah. street is that gay. You go over, you know, a little bit over, over the way is now yeah. Bloods. You go a little bit that way is Crips. Like, talk to me about navigating that, you know, being new to mm -hmm. L.A. and then Inglewood and, and kind of having to navigate that. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's you know, a good as question. A little kid. 
So check this out. You know Oakland. You've been out in Oakland all these years, but you know the, the talk in Oakland is a little different. Like they say mm-hmm. blood. Like, what's up, blood yeah. in Oakland, right? Yeah. So I grew yeah. up saying, you know, and blood was like, you know, what's up, my boy? Mm-hmm. So I moved to L.A., and I moved in a, a, a crip neighborhood. So my first things, my friends, I'm like, yeah, blood, yeah, blood. They like, hey, you can't say that over here. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? As a matter of fact, mm-hmm. you and I had like some red shoe strings. So I was like, you can't wear that over here. And I was just batching my shoes. Mm-hmm. So basketball culture and gang culture, especially when you start becoming good, it kind of go hand in hand. And when, mm-hmm. and when you live in these type of neighborhoods, and so I had to learn that when I first got to LA. Then I moved to Inglewood, so now I know what's up. You know, Inglewood is mostly predominantly blood. But that's a good thing you asked, Dre, and with the people, the story ain't told enough is how gang culture and basketball culture kind of go hand in hand, especially in the hood. So when you start becoming good, you know, you grow up in certain neighborhoods, they look out for you now, you know? So they fat. look out for you now. So now, like, when you see guys in the NBA do certain signs, they, they might not be gangbangers, but they might be tied to them because they grew up around and so that's how it was for me. You know, they get you some shoes. They make sure you go to the park. Ain't nobody messing with you. You got a future. They looking out. You know what I'm saying? So that's the story in all itself. You know, just, just being around them and like, man, this is who I grew up around. You know, this is where I live. You know, and they mm-hmm. like, look, you don't need to get involved with all this smoking and drinking on the corner, doing what we do. But we're going to make sure if any of us can make it out the hood, it's going to be you. So we're going to look out for you. So. You know, and I'm thankful for the guys that looked out for me growing up, not I, knowing that I, I couldn't be in certain places telling me where not to go or making sure I didn't show up here. And, and that's a, definitely a difficult thing to navigate. You know, and, and I always say you definitely got to surround yourself around the right people. And I didn't find myself hanging with them, but I lived in the neighborhood. And so I think it's important to really surround yourself around people who are going to have positive influence on you. But also you got to keep a distance on what to do and what not to do. Because then we make it to the NBA, Dre, and, and, and you still have some of these ties. But mm-hmm. you got to, like, grow up at some point. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes I'm, I may be referencing to guys that I play in the league with today. You know, maybe some things happen with Ja. I, I don't know the complete story with that. But maybe that has something to do with, you know, your surroundings and the people you're around. So the one message I will say is just be able to navigate that if you got a bright future, if you think you can make yourself – uh, get yourself out the hood and, and and make a better life for yourself. And you need to do that. Yeah. No, I, and I always, you know, I agree with you 100% because, you know, guys in my neighborhood, if I, you know, if I went the wrong way, they like, nah, you know, or you come over there, you like, yo, I want to shoot dice or, right. you know what I'm saying? You come, you, you, you go, you reach for the J, they like, man, I slapped the shit out of you. If you don't, you don't like, right. you, you not doing this. You got to be the, you, you got to make it like, Right. You got to be the one to make it out of here. You you're not doing this and the sense of I won't even necessarily say protection, but just like them looking out, like the way guys in the hood looked out for you, it is actually total opposite of what people outside of the hood think. People outside right. of the hood think you grow up in the hood and it's the guys in the hood pulling you in. Like, hey, man, mm-hmm. we want to draw you in. Nah. And it's actually the total opposite. The guys exactly. in the hood like, yo, don't do this. Like, I'm don't already do over here doing this. Right. This ain't it, bro. Like, it may look cool. Yeah. And, like, don't get me wrong. I got respect. Like, I got this. I'm a little clout. But this ain't the clout and respect you want. Like, get right. away from over here. And so that's one thing I've always, always respected, like, from – you know, the OGs in the hood that I grew up in, the OGs from hoods you grew up in and different OGs mm-hmm. you know around, like, they like, nah, bro, this ain't it. Like, right. you go that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and so. that's a story that needs to be told more. You know, and I think there's a story mm-hmm. and all that. And I've been, I've been talking to people about that, though, straight up. Yeah, 100%. So. 100%. You, you, then, you then leave, you leave Inglewood, you go to Kansas, uh, you win three Big 12 players of the year. Um, and you know, in three years of playing at Kansas, which is unheard of, people don't do that. Uh, talk to me about why? Why did you stay so long? Like you knew you were dominating, you Big Twelve Player of the Year as a freshman. Then you went again as a sophomore. Why did you end up staying at Kansas for three years as opposed to going to the NBA even earlier? Yeah, to be honest with that, I could have left my sophomore year, but that I wasn't ready. 
I told myself I wasn't ready, just mentally and physically, because I came in as a young freshman. I stepped on campus at 17 and, okay. and played three years, left at 20. But I wasn't ready, Dre, to be honest, because 95, KG left straight to the league. That's the first time that ever happened. We left McDonald's. Everybody like, what college you going to? All the top players. KG was the only one that didn't commit. He was like, I'm going to the league. So everybody was like, damn, you could do that? So I'm like, oh, okay. So then the next year, I'm a freshman. Next thing you know, Stephon Marbury and Sharif Abdul-Rahim was one and out. So that was the first year of guys going one and out in college. So mm-hmm. KG started the high school, and then the one and done was started. So I think my class was responsible for a lot of that, you know, moving forward with the high school guys coming at because if it wasn't, we wouldn't have guys like Kobe, LeBron, t Mag, Dwight. You know, KG really kicked the door in for that. And then after that, but the norm, Dre, was three years and out. That was the norm. In the 90s, 80s, you know, you you mature, you played three years, and, and after your third year, that was leaving early. Mm-hmm. You know, and okay. Steph and Sharif and KG did that. You know, nobody was, that was like taking the leap early. Until mm-hmm. now, everybody freshmen, freshmen, sophomores, high school players until they cut that from the NBA. So, but that was the culture. Leaving early was the third year. Uh, you did three and then you left early. So that's why I stayed. Okay. All right. Cause I, I, I I've looked at that a million times. Like, yeah. yo, he destroying everybody. Why yeah. did he stay here? Like I stayed yeah. in four, I stayed four. And, I had to stay four years in yeah. school. Like I had no choice. Because they just, KG was the first year they start drafting for potential before you got drafted on if you was ready or not. Because before that, the number one pick was coming in damn near averaging 18, 19 in the game. Mm-hmm. Damn near second, third year, you are all-star from the number one pick because they were a little more mature. And after that, KG come in, they start drafting on potential. Okay. No, that's, that's, that's. So that's yeah. a little history lesson right there. I, I, I appreciate that because I, <laughs> I was, I was tripping on that. Uh, but then you go to the Celtics. Um, and you balling, but from a team standpoint, it don't start off great. I mean, uh, y'all, we garbage. You know, we garbage. Like <laughs> Celtics, tra- tra- Celtics tradition, excuse me, <laughs> tradition, um, all the championships, the Burrs, Robert Parrish, Bill mm-hmm. Russell, uh, the, you know, the list goes on and on. How was it dealing with that? Because Boston, Boston ain't the nicest town. Like these, nah. these fans... They, nah, ain't, they, ain't. they ain't just like, oh, we cool. They, we happy to have you nah, here. They might boo they, you. They expect the titles. Boo, yeah, they might boo you, man. It was rough coming in there early. And, and I remember I got drafted 10. And I remember taking the ball out as a rookie. they like, who, who is this? Y'all draft this motherfucker? I was like, damn. It's like one of my first <laughs> few games. Like, damn. You got to have thick skin to play in certain organizations or you'll get ran out by not only the fans or the media. But luckily, you know, I came in like, look, I'm going to be me. I don't really hear crowd noise. I'm going to make my mark right away. And I was able to establish a friendship with Twan. And it was rough at first, you know, because I came from Inglewood where we won. I came with the Kansas. We won a lot of games. And to get on a, a team to where it's like no playoffs, under 500, going home early was like culture shock. It was not only a culture shock moving from L.A. to Boston, culture shock just basketball-wise. And then you up in the stands, you're looking at Bill Russell. you like, Red R back, you putting your head down, but I know we young and we got to learn and, you know, you take your growing pains, but, you know, that's a part of the game. It's, you know, some situations is different than others. Mine's, you know, we have our growing pains, but I feel like it worked out in the long run. I, I, and, and there was another side of that that most people won't even think about, but going from L.A. to Boston, you grew yeah. up a Laker fan. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I hate that hatred. Boston. <laughs> yeah, I hate Boston. Everybody know that. Well documented. I think even today, Boston is one of the more hated franchises in all of the world. I mean, not maybe in America, because you got the brand that's good outside, but like in America, and they always, Boston's always been like one of them black hat teams. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why I hated them. And even when I played, we got, I, people hated me. I mean, I got booed in a lot of arenas. And I don't know, it's just something about the black hat the Boston Celtic franchise wears because when you're so good and 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 a story franchise, maybe people looked at that. And, you know, when they compare with the Lakers, people are going to choose the Lakers over Boston any day, you know, because that's the comparable 
when you talk about great franchises. So mm-hmm. I've been I, I learned to get comfortable uh being wearing a black hat. Uh, I learned to get comfortable. I learned to just understand like, look, if this is gonna be what it is, then I'm gonna accept that. But it's not gonna move me or shake me either way. And it's something I had to live with. And and that's been my identity. And I'm fine with that. Mm-hmm. No, no doubt. I respect that. Uh, and <clears throat> during your time there, you 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 then established yourself as one of the better better wings in the league, making all yeah. NBA All Stars over and over again, earning the nickname the Truth. Uh, then y'all reach a point where it's not going great. Doc's essentially about to be on his way out. Yeah, uh, about to get was, fired. They was calling for him. Like, the doc's about to be on his way out. And from what I've heard, you're possibly going to get out of there soon, too, just right. just for your own right. career. Yeah. Y'all, you, you then find out that y'all about to get Ray Allen, y'all about to get KG. Um, what was your thoughts? Were you worried about sacrificing shots? Because for so long now you've been here, you've been the man, you, you, you do what you want to do. Or was that for you like, this is my chance to win and become a Boston Celtics legend. How did you accept that as, as that starts to happen? Man, it was just like, yeah, I want to say, I just, all I ever wanted to do was win in Boston, man. And I was just like, all I ever wanted to drink was just a shot. Just a shot. You know, I'm envious of all these other great wing players. I'm watching Cole win it all. I'm watching guys like Manu Ginobili win it all. Uh, guys in my position, you know, having success in the playoffs. And I, I just said, man, I'm looking at these other players play with other great players. Mm-hmm. I had to, I got a chance to play with Antoine Walker. We went to the Eastern Conference Finals and we traded him. We this close. So I'm like, damn, we trade, we, we running backwards. All I ever want is a shot as a competitor. That's all you ever want. Just give me a shot with another great player and let me see if we can pull something off. And so when that happened, dog, Ray came and I was like, oh, okay, I'm not getting traded. We I'm in this for the long run. Then we get KG. That's all I asked for. You know, the years going the good years, the bad years. Just give me a shot. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? You got D Wade, get to play with Braun and Shaq and all these other great players, get the team up. Because you can't win by yourself in this league. You need other great players. Can we be. all know. And I don't care how great you are, you need another great player. And that's all I asked for. So once I got them, even though we only won one title, we was hurt the next year. And then uh, the following year, we went back to the finals, played the Lakers again, 2010. We were 12 minutes away with the lead. I'm happy I got a shot. I could have won two. If KG don't get hurt, we, we was on pace to win 70 games the next year. And so I'm just thankful that I even got a shot later in my career because if we had got together when we was young, Boy, we would have looked like y'all warriors, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. We would have looked like y'all. No we doubt. was together at 26, 27. Oh, it would have been a problem. Yes, sir. Man, let Tell me, me ask this. you, though. No, do you feel oh, like do you feel like we started that big t- super team thing? For sure. For sure. 100 percent So we was the influence on Braun and then KD and all of that, and everybody coming together. Well, yeah. I think I think also a thing that it did was it allowed you to see that it was possible. Yeah, so we yeah, had yeah. like before that we didn't know this was possible. Like but when you, all of a sudden it's now you, Ray Allen, and KG. Like right. this no 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 one ever even thought of these things before. Like how is this right. even possible? And so I think that opened up the the the, the world of possibilities. Now uh-huh. you're like ah okay it I can do this coexist. now I can put. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, we yeah. can put this together now, you know? And so I think um, when that happened, everybody's just like, okay, now you can put these pieces into place because I've seen it happen. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I think another thing, see, everybody always talk about you, Ray, and KG, which, by the way, should be talked about. But nobody ever talk about y'all had a great young point guard in Rondo. Ooh, boy. Like, how important was Rondo to what y'all was Man, doing? Man, Rondo was so big to everything because he was the youngest. And 
they wasn't sure at first if Rondo can be the point guard with them. Because he was only in like his second or third year. Second, yep. you know, he was in his second year. So yep. it was a lot of talks about maybe training Rondo. Do we need an older point guard? I was like, nah, this I saw his rookie year. I was like, this dude gonna be nice. He showed me mm-hmm. flashes in his rookie year. And I was like, uh, oh, he actually the perfect guard for us because he's a pass first guard. Yeah. So yeah. I was rocking with him. He, he was picking up full court. He played deep and he always made the right decisions. IQ was off the charts. Mm-hmm. And see, that's that's the thing about Rondo. More than his skill, his IQ. And you saw that. And just to have that pass first point guard who was mature for his age, that was the perfect storm for us. Yeah. Um, as far as demeanor, like you're an alpha. KG's an alpha. Oh, man, I don't know Ray. Old, I don't know Ray that well, but he uh, like he, he, I would I would say he like more of a sniper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like quiet, like I'll get you, but yeah. I'm gonna go under the radar with mine a little bit more. Yeah, but he a sniper. But yeah, he, how did a young Rondo handle that? Because Rondo is like Ron, do tough as shit, and he an alpha. He a one hundred percent alpha. Mm-hmm. How how did he adjust to that? Where he's an alpha. And he's the point guard running the show. But, like, you got these OGs in here. Mm-hmm. Like, how, how was that adjustment for Rondo? You know what Rondo did was probably the best thing he did. You know, as a young player, when you come in, and I always say this to young players, you know, find a vet that you can come up under. You know, that can show mm-hmm. you. Get a good mm-hmm. vet, though, that you can come up under, listen to what he got to say, and, and he going to show you the way. First thing he did, he went, to, he went to Ticket University. He checked in the Ticket University. Got up under his wing, and that's where he started developing that mentality. He went right to Ticket. Ticket took him under his wing every day in Rondo here, every day in the locker room, on the court. And that's why you see the he had it in him, but it just started growing. It started growing. And it was hard on him because as a scorer, as a guy who wants the ball, uh, you know, I'm on him. Like, you know, bring it mm-hmm. this way. But he was so smart. And the point guard is the hardest position where you got to distribute to guys who need the ball. But he handled it good, though. He went under ticket, developed the mentality. Even it was nice, me and him might argue. He stood on his business, and I'm like, all right, I respect it. You saw something different. All right, cool. And we moved on from it. And it was it was, it was just the perfect for him to just be under that. And now as Rondo grew and you saw his mentality, he quiet too, but don't, don't push his button. Mm-hmm. Don't push his mm-hmm. button, you know. So it, it, he... he he had Alpha too, though. But we had a lot of them, though. Perk, Leon Poe, Eddie House, Posey, uh, Big Baby. I mean, if we got into a team fight, I'm not sure anybody wanted to see us. It's all, we, we had so many big dogs. Tony Allen, damn, I forgot about yep. T.A. Damn. T.A., yeah. Damn. But, like, yeah, that was the funnest time. And we all kicked it. We all kicked it. We all went out together. We all ate together. We, we just did everything together, you know, so it, it made it fun. And, you know, I appreciate them dudes and Rondo and all them. No doubt. Uh, and speaking of appreciation, y'all win the finals, hurt the next season, go back to the finals. Ray then joins the Miami Heat. Um, I want to hear your side of that, that story. That like, like, talk talk to me about that. I, I need to hear your side we, we, to we, Ray doing that. Man, so, you know, Ray came in as we a brotherhood. Our families hang out with each other. His kids, my kids, we go to his house for, you know, Halloween parties and Super Bowl and vice versa. So when it, when it hit that, he was, we just lost to Miami, by the way. Uh, and, our, and I'm like, all right, you know, we just need to regroup, get a couple more young dudes. Then we're going to re-sign Ray. We're going to stay and lined up our contracts. And finish this thing out together. And by the way, I hope y'all bring Clay back. Y'all need to finish together. You know, I hope that's an Absolutely. example of how we went. And y'all don't do that. You know, mm-hmm. give him what he want. You know, right? And I think, you know, I didn't know he had issues with the contract or starting. But the thing is, I wanted you to holler. Like, if you're going to leave us, like, give me a call. Like, look, it ain't working out. Uh, you know, they're not going to give me the contract I want. They're not giving me the role I want. So I'm going to go this route. Okay, man, I respect that. You make a, a business decision for you and your family. 
cool. But when you never get that call, you leave and go to the team who we pretty much, this is our rival. Mm-hmm. We just, we mm-hmm. playing these cats to see who going to the finals the next few years. Like, come on, man. I, I just didn't feel like there was a respect thing there. And I don't run into reta- a Ray after that until retirement. So I don't talk to him. And he don't talk to me. You know, even when we play each other, there's no words, really. And I felt a certain kind of way about that. So I had a chance to, I was playing this exhibition game in China in retirement, my first year retire. And I, and I didn't even know Ray was going to be there. So next thing you know, he's like, oh, by the way, Ray is here in the, in the locker room next to you. And I'm like, all right, you know, what? Let me go holler at him. So I was I went over there like, look, this, I told him how I felt about the situation. He was like, man, you know what? After I broke it down to him like that, he was like, you're right. I should have did it different. After that, I was like, it's all good. We spoke on it. We shook. And there's been love, and it's been love since there. So why at the 75th did you and KG do that when Ray walked past? Because I didn't know it was love now. Wait, when? when? Y'all was like laughing. You and 75th anniversary, you and KG Uh was laughing when Ray walked through, and I thought it was still some beef. No, I was going to ask you. Okay, so y'all good now. Yeah, we good now. Yeah, we good. It wasn't no okay. beef by the time because the 75 was last year. We was good before yeah. that. Because remember, if you notice, when KG got his jersey retired, we all hugged at half court, mm-hmm. which was like a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, he was like, shout out to Ray. Plus, tickets, I was good, but ticket wasn't good until his retirement. You don't even know. We didn't know Ray was coming to his retirement. That was the big thing surrounding KG retirement. Yeah. When he was getting his jersey retired, we like, it's Ray coming. You know, you think Ray going to show up? Nobody had the idea. I didn't. So when he showed up, I think that was a sign. Like, you know what? It's time to squash that. KG, Rondo, let's bring it in. And I think from that point, we all squashed it. I already had squashed mine with him. But at KG jersey retirement, I think it was just like, all right, they spoke. It was cool. Now everybody good now. Uh, I love that, man. Because, you know. Um, you go through these, like, and like you say, y'all won one, but it's hard winning a championship. Like, yeah, for sure. You know, people don't understand how hard it is, how many things have to go right. Yeah. You gotta be, you gotta be really good, but you also have to be really lucky. Yeah. You gotta be really lucky. Really lucky. You start talking about health. All the time. You don't win championships without luck. I'm sorry. Without luck at all. People don't know. You look at the amount of teams. Fact, you look at the amount of teams that you thought was going to win a championship. They were unlucky. Yep, yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, like Houston, they they got y'all. They got y'all. Chris Paul pull a hamstring. Like, hey, I'm telling you, you need it in every championship. Toronto beat y'all because they got lucky KD got hurt. Exactly. Oh, I they see it every hurt. year. Yeah, I see it every year, bro. You got to be lucky in all of this. And, that, and that's the part. That's the part people don't get. No matter how good, you got to be lucky. We playing against Houston. They missed 27 threes in a row. This is what they do. They shoot threes. They've never done that. They missed 27 threes in a row. You have to be a little lucky. Right. <laughs> it's just the reality. It's just the reality. Yeah, that's crazy. That is crazy. But, but. but in saying that, um, and I, I mentioned it earlier, you know, Doc was kind of on his way out. Then y'all, Ray come in, K, KG come in. Y'all get it rolling. Y'all get Doc his first and only championship. Hasn't quite been able to get over the hump since. Uh, now, as we all know, Doc is now with the Milwaukee Bucks mm-hmm. um, trying to, number one, salvage their season. But number two, go on to win a championship. They made the trade for Dame. They obviously got Giannis, Chris Middleton, Jay Crowder, uh, Bobby Portis, Brooke Lopez, Pat Barrett now. Mm-hmm. What do you think Doc brings to that team, and can he help them get over the hump to win a championship this season or next? I will tell you one thing. Doc is a great motivator, man. I'm telling you. He knows... He knows each individual and how to coach each individual. You know, he he, he coaches them all different. You know, he don't co- he's not gonna coach Giannis how he coach Bobby Portis. And old school coaches, they gonna coach one way. It's their way or the highway. And that's one thing that Doc has been great at because he's been a player. He understands, you know, what they need and when they need it. 
And I think he's the he's the right guy to help them get over the hump, actually. You know, your players got to respect your coach. I think they respect Doc. You know, I'm not sure how much they res- respect it, Adrian Griffith or why would they get him out of there? Doc is going to come with some respect. Yeah, he hasn't won as many as people probably thought he should, but he's been there, and they're going to yes. respect that. And so in saying that, I think he's going to bring some leadership and another voice. Because, like, when you look at Milwaukee, you're like, who's the, like, vocal leader? I really don't know. I'm not in the locker room. Maybe it's Giannis. Maybe it's Dane. But Doc is going to be another vocal leader in the locker room, and he's going to, he's going to tell you like it is. And I respect that. Like, whether you like it or not, he's going to keep it true to you. So hopefully, you know, he can get them far, but I don't think they're going to beat the Celtics in the East. You know, yeah. it's, it's bad timing right now. Yeah. <laughs> but he got a championship. <laughs> it's bad time, but I think he got a championship caliber team. And I think uh, I think they're going to see the Celtics in the conference finals. I respect that. I respect mm-hmm. that. Um, man, it's the year 2000, and you get stabbed mm-hmm. 11 times. Number one, how do you still manage to play 82 games? <laughs> it's beyond man. me. Uh, and I know you've talked about this story before, mm-hmm. but... Like, <laughs> what's something from that story that people don't know? And, and like I said, I also want to know, how did you manage to play 82 games? I don't know, right? I don't even know how I'm alive, truthfully, when I look back at it. You know, I think just the, I think God, you know, I'm a true believer in God. You know, I think, you know, he, he knows when your time is and it wasn't my time. And I think the only thing, let me tell you something, Dre, what people don't know, but I haven't spoke on, I talked about the incident and being in the club and, and you know, being stabbed by like multiple men and three different knives. And what people don't know, I played because I played through pain. But that was the only thing that my, being on the court was the only thing that gave me peace. You, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm traumatized. I'm, I'm in my house. I'm, I'm, I'm scared. But at the same time, I'm paranoid. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm okay. Sleep, like I have to wear like a vest. And this is what people don't know. I have to wear a vest underneath my uniform. So like a lot of times, if I take a charge or I go into the paint, I felt that it wasn't all the way healed, and I had to just mentally play through that because I know I wanted to be on the court because that's the only piece I got from not thinking about what happened for that three hours, that three four hours. That gave me peace. And, you know, when you go through a whole day when you can't sleep at night and you're sitting around, not leaving the house, not going nowhere, you know, wondering if it's really somebody out here trying to kill you, you know, that's not a good, that's not a good mental to be in, you you know? So, but for that three, four hours I'm in the gym, I'm going to be on the court. So I disobeyed doctor's orders. I practiced before I was supposed to practice. I wore this like damn near bulletproof vest or whatever kind of vest they got for me. And I just played through it until I healed. And I, I really didn't heal until after the season. That's crazy, man. And how did you manage to stay in Boston another 10 years after that? Like, like how long did it take you to start leaving again, to go out again, to live a normal life again in the city where you just got stabbed, stabbed yeah. up by with three, four dudes. Yeah. Like, how how were you able to get back to some sense of normalcy in that city? You know, it took a a while, but I surrounded myself with some family and friends because immediately I moved out two of my cousins who are the same age as me, two of my best friends who I grew up with, and I moved into Boston with me. So I had family around me at all times. Uh, You know, people watching out for me. I kept it, I kept it family and I kept it close. but it took some years, man. It took some years. Even going to the restaurant, dude, I was just, I had security. I'm over here, like, seeing who know my car. I got them standing outside, went inside. And it took some years for me to really start getting back to normal because it got to the point I get, I get real anxious when I got in the crowd. You know, I, you know, I couldn't do the season tickets holder stuff uh, with the crowd of people, appearances I wasn't doing. So, but the thing that helped me the most was started when I started talking about it to other people, you know, because I held it in for a few years, but then I started talking to more people about it and it helped me get comfortable. 
with like just letting it free, letting it out, loosening up. And that's the biggest thing that helped me. Cause at first I had a psychiatrist or psychologist, whoever you talk to after. And I had two sessions with him and I was like, man, I don't want to talk about this no more. And from that point in, I held it in. But I think talking to people and surrounding myself with love really helped me get through those times. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the people who I was close to and the people I was able to talk to about it. And, uh, yeah, it was difficult. And I used the game of basketball to rededicate myself. And I think, you know, for me to take that next step to where I got to, something like that maybe had to happen. Maybe God was sending a message to where, like, look, you need to refocus, get back in the gym. And I really think from that point on, it elevated my game from that point on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, some, some, some traumatic like that. It does one or two things to people. It's seeing you this way. Yeah, absolutely. Or it's seeing you that way. And absolutely. It's very, like, you're very sure which way that guy went. Like, yeah. Because yeah, it's it drastic either difference. way. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. It can go either way, man. But I was, I was raised by some strong, by a strong mom. Taught me always to just be strong and you're going to get through whatever situation you, you're going to get through. And so that's just the cloth I was built on. And that's why I was able to get through it. Uh, no doubt, man. And, and switching gears a little bit, not really, but in the same light of you playing 82 games that year, you play 80 plus games seven times in your career. Mm -hmm. um, what is your perspective on this this current debate? Load management, uh, guys resting, um, the 65 game award. You know, you got to play 65 yeah. games in order to be All NBA MVP. All those things. What's your like? How do you view that as someone who played 80 plus games? Seven times. I mean, I really don't see the science at the low management because they don't prevent injuries. I play 80 plus games. I play 17 plus season without any major injuries. I was lucky. But it's no science to like, if you rest, you're going to be less likely to get injured. And so mm -hmm. I just say this, if you love the game, ain't nobody telling me I can't play tonight. Uh, that's just, that's just me. And I, and I see that with just only certain people in the league, you know? And, and I never seen Bron, Bron, like Bron don't sit down. Like I done seen Bron come into the garden. I'm talking about, he rolled his ankle like this. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking like, oh yeah, he for sure done for the night. Two minutes later, he come back out there and catch a lob. And I'm like, damn, mm -hmm. that's crazy. Like, it, it, like mm -hmm. today kids roll their ankle. I get it, sit out or, you know, I play with a dislocated thumb, but it's just different now. I, I don't know what it is. I think it has a lot to do with the people around in the organization, the, like the medical staff or these doctors here. They convince us, like, no, this is the right thing to do. And we created more jobs for these people to come into the NBA. And so they got a job to do. And when you got all this big medical team, the medical team wasn't like that when I was in the league, uh, Dre. Now you got more physical therapists in the back room where it was only like one or two. You got a, a one that can treat every player. And then you got ones that's like, look, you know, no long run, you know, not only this year, but your career, but no, no science is proving that you're not going to get hurt ever when we do this. So I'm not again, I'm not with it, but it's the way of the NBA. And I like the 65 game rule actually, you know, because if a guy plays 60 games, how is he better than this guy who plays 72 games and his team is doing well? You know, give it to the guy who's been out there the whole time. You know, these awards. And so, I, I, and I mean, I just think that's the way it should be, man. You know, hold these care players accountable. Yeah, if you if you pressing yourself to play 65 and you got an injury, that's on you. Don't be pressed to make all NBA. Don't be pressed to to, to do all this stuff, get yourself right first and yeah. then play. You know, if guys is playing hurt, that's on them. Yeah, no, no doubt. I respect that. You Speaking of Brian, you've made a few comments about Brian. Uh, you said yeah. you made him join the Heat. Uh, you, you said uh, that he wasn't top five player in the NBA. Uh, a lot of people has called your takes on Brian as you hit it. <laughs> um, where where do you stand? Like, do you still think Brian ain't a top five player in NBA history? Uh, first of all, I'm going to clear that up. I've never, I did say that. But it was based on when they was playing the Portland Trailblazers, 
in the bubble. And I think Portland went up 2-0, or they won the first one, or maybe they didn't even start the series. But I was like, all right, they got AD, they got this. And I was like, if they lose to the Blazers in the playoffs first round, I don't want to hear about Brown being top five because I felt like they had a championship team, which they went on to win the championship in the bubble mm-hmm. that year. And so do I think Brown is a top five player? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I mean, I've went on record saying this. After they won that chip, I said, LeBron has cemented himself as the number two to me player all time now. Little did I know he was going to go for 40,000. Little did I know he was going to break all these other records. This is like four years ago. LeBron is in that gold argument to where you could just say he might be the GOAT. You know, his, his longevity, the records he's had, I mean, yeah, it's who you like, whatever area you played in, whatever, but Braun has a serious argument. And I will say this about Braun. I wouldn't be who I am today without Braun. And I will say that. For the simple fact that I got to match up with him, for the simple fact that I, I get to have these epic games against him, I wouldn't be who I am without him. So I'm, 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 I'm taking my hat off to him in retirement. Did I ever hate Bron? I never hated Bron. I always respected him. It's just that me, in the heat of the battle, on the court, we I'm no friends, bro. Mm-hmm. That's just who I was. Listen, you do what you do with your team over there. I'm going to do with my team. And I ain't no love. And they always came like I was a Bron hater. But no, nah, I appreciate what he done to this game. He's reset the bar, the standard now, and he's pushed the bar so high now that I don't know if in our lifetime there's going to be anybody close to him. And I respect what he's done for the game, not only on the court, but off the court. So I'm happy to come on your platform and let everybody know this. Yeah, I've said some things about Brom, but look, real recognized, real at the end of the day. And He's just been unbelievable, and and I, we appreciate that. No doubt, no doubt, no. I, I respect that. Uh, another one that went went crazy, and I asked this question more so, not even about that moment, but just kind of your take. Because number one, like I said to start, you don't get a nickname the truth <laughs> mm-hmm. without being one of them ones. Like yeah, that's right. that that that's no debate. Like big ticket. The truth, right. the glove, like you, you, King James. Like you look at, you don't get those nicknames right. if you're not one of them ones. And so right. I, I say, you flash like Shaq Diesel. You look at the nicknames guys got. Like you got to be one of them dudes. And if you're not one of them dudes, you don't get nicknames. It's no, just you know what? That's not true. Like this era, where's the nicknames? Joker the nickname. Okay, Joker. I mean, like Steph don't really have a like, nickname. Yeah, he got know, a couple Steph, things like, people trying to it throw it out Chef there. Curry, like you know what I'm saying? Like, Babyface Steph. assassin. We've heard like, the Steph nickname. Yeah, that's, that's what true. I'm saying. Like, that's I true. feel like this era don't like where the nicknames. Like I don't, and they going away. I think that's I true. Think, but you, I, but you had to be one of them ones then to yeah, get one. Absolutely. And saying that, uh, you, 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 and and I can agree. You, you spoken about being underrated uh, in NBA history for what you've done, the things that you accomplished. You also said you were you were better than Dwayne Wade. Um, where should you be ranked as far as that NBA history go when you're talking about great two guards? Like, where, where, where would you put yourself in that? It's tough, man. Uh, and the thing about Wade. And I will say this. Wade is one of the greatest players. I love watching him when I didn't play. But in all of this, I never brought Wade's name up without it being brought to me. That's true. I that's never, true. like, came out and be like, oh, you know, that's when it's hate. That's true. That's, that's what I true. feel like when it ain't brought to you and you just bring it up, I feel like mm-hmm. that's hating. But I was like, but I'm going to tell you this. That's who made me who I am. Because I felt like every time I stepped on the court, I was the best player. Like, mm-hmm. whether it was mm-hmm. Cole, Braun, I felt for like one night, I could be the best player that night. And mm-hmm. for me having that mentality, that's what made me who I am. 
So I said it on national TV, and yeah, I don't, I don't have the accolades Wade had. You know, he played on better teams, but I'm not trying to discredit Wade. Wade is an all-time great. In my eyes, he's probably three, two, three, four best two guards at all time. And so, you know, some stuff of a TV, but I feel like I'm right there. I'm right mm-hmm. there. <laughs> like, it might be like, eh, I'm right. Like, some of these other guys, like, yeah, Cole, Bron, I think, Wayne, I'm right there. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. I, I, I 100% respect that. And so in, in, in saying that, like, you right there, do you think, you know, like, <clears throat> I don't know the full story um, of you being let go at ESPN. I know what I've heard. I yeah. know what I think. It wasn't but no do you think, what you saw. Yeah, <laughs> what I saw. Um, but do you think those things, like that thing, for instance, and then being let go from ESPN and so on and so forth, do you think those things in retirement kind of hindered your name a little bit as a player? Like you know, the way people view you as a player, how great you were, because what one thing I do know is, and, and and even my journey, when you give people one little thing to latch on, yeah, they try to latch on that and minimize everything else that you've done. Yeah. Do you think those things hurt you in the sense of who you or how people speak about Paul player, Paul Pierce, the basketball player, uh, because they intertwine the the poker thing, Instagram yeah. Live, and what some a few things that you said when you were on ESPN. Do you think that hindered your name as a hooper? I think it's hindered my name amongst the young generation. Mm-hmm. But real mm-hmm. hoopers know, and people of my generation know. And so you're going to get little comments of like, he wasn't shit, he wasn't, he didn't play, but whatever. Well, that's not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's you not go true. to YouTube, <laughs> you, you can attack my character, you can attack me as a person, but don't tell me I wasn't shit on a basketball court. That you part. know what I'm saying? So that I can part. live with that. And as a person who's always wore the black hat, I'm fine with that, Dre. I, I live a great life. I, I, I travel the world because of basketball. I got four beautiful kids. And if I'm going to hang on to what other people say about me and how they hinder my name, oh, well, you know what? I'm still living my life. I'm still living the dream. And I can give a damn what these people say or think. Period. Nah. Yeah, I respect that, man, because I've kind of seen that in a different sense. Like, mm-hmm. people attack my character as a man right, because of right. how I play basketball. You know right. what I'm saying? Even with, like, the stuff that I just went through, you know, a couple months ago or whatnot. Right. It's like, that was one of the things that kind of had me like, man, I don't really know if I want to do this no more. Like, y'all, y'all talking yeah. about, like, I, I got kids. You know what I'm saying? My kids will go on YouTube. My kids, you know, my mm-hmm. kids go to school. They got friends yeah. who are Warriors fans. And y'all attacking my character as a man. My kids got to listen to that. You know what I'm saying? Like, because mm-hmm. what one thing I know is you can feel how you want to feel about me as a basketball player. You can say I suck. It's probably not true, but that's how you feel. Say right. what you want. You can say I rose Steph Coattail. Cool. Say all of those things. Right. But when you start talking about the man that I am, right. you know, like, and, because of something I did in the lines of battle, mm-hmm. like in between these lines, that to me kind of like that took me down a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, hold on, man. Like, I'm not, I'm not this guy y'all saying I am. That's nah, you say nah, that about yeah. the basketball player. Cause yeah. like, like you just said, I actually did a story with Howard Beck uh, when we was just at the garden a few days ago, and you said earlier, you said, I'm not the same person. Like, when I'm playing, and me the person, that's two different people. Funny enough, right. I was doing this, this story with Howard Beck, and he was, you know, we're talking about the things that's happened, where I am today, how I'm playing, and blah, blah. Uh, mentioned some Ron Artest stuff in there. And um, I was talking to him, and I kept, like, Flipping back to these two people, like talking to him and in the mind of like me in basketball, right? And then talking to him like in my normal mind. And I told him literally as we're doing the interview, I said, Howard, I'm trusting you to not make me look as stupid as I sound right now, because I may sound like like I'm totally out of my mind right now. I keep telling you like, well, this guy, 
who's the basketball player, thinks this. And this guy who's not the basketball player goes X, Y, and Z. And so I really, like, I, I can sympathize with that, you know, and understand that from a different point of view because I've gone through that, you know what I'm saying? And, like, right. obviously I still get the opportunity to play. And when you get the opportunity to play, I always say you get an opportunity to right the ship because mm -hmm. winning cures all, playing well cures all. But when you're not playing, people don't kind of give you that same grace no more. You know, they yeah, want to, yeah, yeah. it's almost like, it's almost like, okay, I couldn't shit on you when you were playing because you was the truth. But now mm -hmm. here's my chance right, to shit right. on you right. because you're not playing no more. And now all you're going to like, Okay, so they're going to listen to your word. Well, then people look at it like, well, it's my word against yours, you know? Right, right. <clears throat> Let me ask you this, though. Like, you... All right, we going, I'm going off right here. You, well, how, how, long, how many years are you in right now? I mean, you're 12. How many years do you think you want to play? Two, three more. All right, in your last year, are you going to announce this is your last year? Nah. <laughs> Nah. Oh, oh, you don't want no farewell tour? I can't, I, because somebody gonna do me like I like I said to you, and then and then I'm fucked. I'm coming, to the, I'm coming to them games, and I'm gonna yell the same thing you yelled to me. <laughs> hey. Hey. Please, Listen. please announce your last year. It's not the that. only chance. The only <laughs> chance my last year is announced that I'm having the last year. If that last year happens to coincide with Steph's last year, yeah, Clay's last year, and if that's my last year, that's the only chance that it gets announced <laughs> because then I could ride Steph Cotel on his farewell tour and act like his mom. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I never asked for a farewell tour, and my farewell tour was in Boston. Because I know that's the only place they appreciate me. So that's why I gave away. <laughs> that was my farewell too. Everywhere else, I got booed. That's funny. No, I get I get that. I get I get booed <laughs> all the time, man. I get it. Hey, uh, but uh before before we get out of here, yeah. um two more things. Number one, I just want to let you know. Yeah, I I call it game. That that's one of my yeah. favorite interviews of all time. <laughs> like <laughs> Because right, you right. could tell in that moment, and you tell me if I'm lying, but in that moment, when I'm watching you talk, you like, I, I, like, like for real? I call game, like, <laughs> like, 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 what do you mean I call bank? Like, right. I call game. Like, right. like, in that moment right there, that just came off the top of the dome. Right, like, right off the top of the dome. Because I'm like, Chris Broussard over here, like, I ain't hit no game winners before. Like, like I looked at him, I was about to be like, nigga, like, like, he lucky it didn't come out my mouth. <laughs> it's all just like, call gay, and I walked off. That was the end of the end. I was like, he wanted to ask me another question. If you look at it, I walked off on like, man, get out of here. I don't want to hear that yeah. shit. I don't want to nah, hear that. Nah, that come on, epic. man. <laughs> that, that was epic. That's one of my favorite interviews so that to was watch. Off the top. Uh, uh, yeah. Two more questions. You and all KG, right. uh, y'all y'all always, y'all talk about, um, and shout out to y'all, um, unplug uh, all the smoke productions. Y'all, I love y'all doing y'all thing over there. Mm -hmm. Watch a lot of the stuff. Super dope what y'all got going. And I also think it's super dope to see you and KG's bond. Like, yeah. you know, even on times during that show, it looked like y'all looking out for each other. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. I think that's, like, that's super dope because we go through these runs and people don't understand, man, through these runs, you can sometimes build resentment. You around each other every day, like you, yeah, you around each real. other every day. You see the good in people, you see the bad in people. You yeah. see their rough day, you see their great day. You see the drastic difference in between the two. Yeah. Stuff come up, and to see that bond, um, yeah. you know, and, and what I've been able to build with Steph and Clay, like to see that bond still like that, man, that's special. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But, so, but you, you, number one, you gonna understand that because you won with this group. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of groups yeah. have bonds and they split and these teams, they don't have a forever bond. When you won, you know that bond is forever. You, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So not everybody gets to experience that. You know, you be friends in the league then the league is over with or y'all go to another team, you don't want to talk to nobody. You don't even mm -hmm. talk to your teammate. But when you win, that shit is forever. And, and 
But and for the simple fact we live by each other, our kids is going to the same school. Uh, so we we always gonna have that. No, that's special. But y'all talk a lot about uh, the NBA and, and how different it is in the league. Uh, what's 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 the biggest difference to you uh, in the league today than when y'all played? I mean, obviously, the obvious off the top is just the defense and physicality of the game. You know, they don't allow as much holding and bumping and stuff, and they allow a lot of player movement. That's why you see the scoring is up not only individual-wise, but team-wise. I mean, you talk about, I think when I was in the league, the team that led the league in score was like 103, 104 points. Now mm-hmm. you get the team's average on average is 115, 120 to the leaders. Uh, just the physicality. It's like players can't play defense no more. You can't use your hands as much, bump as much, be, and it's allowing the offensive player to always have an advantage. And for the fact that players are getting more skilled. You know, players mm-hmm. at all positions can handle the ball, can shoot the ball extremely well, more athletic. But that's just how the game evolves. It evolves every decade, every Generation evolves, and it's, it's it's good to see, man. I'm actually I actually enjoy it. Uh, I didn't like the All Star game, you know. I wish it was a little more competitive, but on the overall, I think the game is in a good place. Uh, the European players are really stepping up, showing they they got what it take, and but I think the game is in a good place. I'm not sure if we'll ever see another dynasty again. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way the player movement is. You know, before, you know, you had so much loyalty to one franchise and you guys will probably be the last to stay with one franchise forever. But with the player movement, it'll be hard to see another dynasty, uh, which is great. You know, I think it's great because you'll have some newness to it every year. You ain't going to have a team just overly dominated. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's not. I like I like to see kind of like some uh, some dynasty. I like the Georgia run. And, you know, I think y'all, uh, Still can have another run. Y'all still are dangerous in the playoffs. And so, uh, you know, that's that's the biggest difference I see. Uh, most definitely. You just mentioned the All-Star game. I remember watching All-Star games that you was in. How can how can we get that back? I lied to you. I said two no, more but questions. Look, I think it but started this... at the top, Dre. I think it got to come from LeBron and KD. Because I remember LeBron and, and Kobe like, look, we got to get this in a, in a huddle. Mm-hmm. And then you look mm-hmm. over Kobe – he picking up full court. You're like, oh, he's serious. So now everybody else like, oh, oh, we can't be bullshitting now. Come on now. Kobe ain't playing. AI, let's go, man. Let's let's get this money. You know, I think it come from the guys at the top. You know, mm-hmm. and so if they come in there and, and you got Bron and Steph like and KD and, and, and Giannis like, let's play, let's go. Maybe y'all, you know, for three quarters we, but fourth quarter you knew it was going to be on. Absolutely. And, 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 and at least want to see that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And last but not least, man, I can't help uh, but notice these retired numbers behind <laughs> you and your number yeah. being on there. And, and just being a part of you, you get your jerseys retired with the Boston Celtics. That ain't that ain't no that ain't, that no, ain't no small feat. No. <laughs> like no. that, that's not a small feat. No. Your number being retired up there amongst those other greats, man. Just talk to me about that feeling. Uh, the day when it happened, but also, you know, every time you walk in that gym, those greats, being mm-hmm. one of those greats, just talk to me about that. You know, I'm happy that all the hard work and the dedication I put to this game and the hours, the blood, sweat, the tears I was able to put in that people didn't really get to see. They just saw the finished product on the court. That's what that is. You know, at nights when I'm waking up at three, four in the morning and going for a run or, or going to the gym, that's what turned into that. You know, just sacrifice from not being around friends and family on, on special days, Christmases, uh, holidays, and birthdays where you don't get to see people that you love is because of my grind and being in the league. And that's the stuff that people don't see the sacrifices that we make as athletes and the dealing with this person need money or your best friend just got shot or I just lost my close homie. They don't understand. Like it's more than what you see on the court, but you to still keep your mind in the same frame to really still keep going. Whereas days you really want to stop. 
but you keep going and that's what that equal. You know, me being able to mm-hmm. walk into the garden and, and my number be there forever. Now that I was able to leave my legacy and left my mark, uh, not only with the Celtics, but the game of basketball. And so, you know, being around, having a check when he was there, when he was alive, rest in peace, Bill Russell, and just doing it in front of them, it was just, I wanted to be as, as great as I could and push myself to the limit. And, you know, that's a product of me getting my jersey retired, which I'm heavily thankful for, because I gave the game my life. And mm-hmm. before that, I missed out on a lot of things in life. So, Dre, when you retire, it's more to life than hoops, man. Travel the world. Enjoy your family, man. So much more for us to see, man. And, 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 and I'm enjoying retirement. That's incredible to hear. Uh, that that means a lot because it's the inevitable for all of us, right? right. Like we all going to one day be out of this league. And to hear, you know, we always hear the shit stories. You know what I'm yeah, saying? You always yeah. hear like, hey, man, it ain't, ain't great over here. Like enjoy that. Way. And like, yeah, we want to enjoy it. But I actually am one. Like, I look forward to retire. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, I ain't, I I appreciate the NBA. The NBA has um, allowed me to live an incredible life, to provide a great life for my family. But I'm excited for what's on the other side. You know what's I'm next? not? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like this, to your point, this, this job, like, you, if there's a wedding, you miss it. If there's a childbirth, you can possibly miss it. If there's mm-hmm. a birthday, you miss it. You know right. what I'm saying? If there's a school assembly, you miss it. If there's a fellas trip in the month of March, you miss it. You know what I'm saying? If they're like, you miss so much. You miss and your kids' first steps. Like, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Just little steps, like, damn. Absolutely. So, you know, so I, don't I, I don't take it for granted, man. And I, I appreciate you hearing you say that. I appreciate you coming on the show. It means a lot. It says a lot yeah, about you. Sure. I'm glad, uh, number I, I'm one. glad I got to share my side of the story finally. <laughs> absolutely absolutely and, and i'm happy you let out with it before we go jackson turn your video on i just want y'all to see jackson fan out you know this celtic shit they got going on yeah. over here all our listeners know jackson is a huge celtics fan up, so this Jack? is a moment for jackson and <laughs> jackson how your moment go ahead and fucking fan out goddamn celtics <laughs> hey thanks man thanks dg paul i was um I was 12 when the Celtics won in 2008. So I was really right when I was coming into my true uh, basketball fandom and basketball obsession. So I just want to say oh, thank you for coming up. on the show. This is a really full circle moment for me. You were my, you were my favorite player back then. So thank you for coming on the show. And I appreciate everything you did uh, for the Celtics. All right. Hey, man, ask Draymond, was the game plan not to guard Jalen Brown the other day? It was. <laughs> it was the game plan. It, it, it was in host that he was going to shoot a bunch of shots, hijack the offense, so that Jason Tate... And by the way, just so you know, it actually was working. You looked at the score sheet at one point, It was he was three for seven, JT had not taken the shot, Drew had not taken the shot, and then all of a sudden, we, on offense, we were awful, and we weren't moving the ball or passing, and they started getting out in transition, JT oh hit the God. three, Drew hit the three, and then it looked like the game plan made no sense. But it actually hey. made sense, and I think it could have <laughs> nah, worked. Nah, nah, nah. 52 so look, points it, later, it didn't work. Nah, if y'all meet in the finals this year, y'all need to scrap that game plan. <laughs> I don't think we're going to go with it in the finals. <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's going I don't think I don't think it's going to go in the finals but I'll tell you what for both of you two Celtics Celtics legend Celtics fan I'll tell you what walking in that other day them boos ain't as loud as they was fellas they are they, not they, as they loud not as, as they loud. were they not as loud no more <laughs> <laughs> no, truth hey, I appreciate God, you brother you, thank you for coming on the show man all love dog all love yes, for sure love bro no doubt <laughs>